Um, I hope you agree that that, I mean, I found that last session, other than the chairing, which is a bit rubbish, the, the content was absolutely fascinating. I enjoyed, enjoyed it a lot. And this session will be equally fascinating. Innovative finance, I mean, the questions of finance came up in the last session. And as I say, we, we have some superior moderation this time. I'm delighted to welcome Polita Clark, Associate Editor at the FT. Uh, Polita has been writing on environment and general business issues, business life issues for a very long time. She has a special place in the heart of the Smith School uh, because it's not every day that you get a joke into the Financial Times and especially it's not every day that you get a joke of your founder uh, into the Financial Times. I don't know whether it's a good joke or not a good joke. I'm starting to wonder whether I should tell the joke, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll leave that for Martin late, later on, at the right moment, with the, because he has superior comic timing to I do. Anyway, you don't want to hear from me. Polita, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Cameron, and um, what a great session. I, I wish you had um, stopped saying that um, you were such a bad moderator when you were such a brilliant moderator and uh, building up expectations for me to an unreasonable level. But anyway, it's great to be here today. Very pleased uh, to be chairing this discussion on uh, innovative finance and really how the financial sector can drive the trillions of dollars of capital needed um, to, to try to foment the energy transition that we know um, is needed along with another, a number of other um, crucial um, areas of climate financing. Um, it, it's, it's actually quite interesting, I think, to, to think about the fact that it wasn't that many years ago that um, it was really just uh, widely regarded, that uh, widely seen that climate change was something that governments um, and scientists could kind of sort out, and it was something that um, the financial sector really wasn't seen as being a, a major player um, for for many, well, for, for a long time. That obviously changed really quickly, and we've seen investors um, taking climate factors into account uh, in a way that you know never seen possible when I was uh, first the FT's environment correspondent. Um, at, at last year's COP26 meeting in Scotland, we saw the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero um, announced where hundreds of asset managers, banks, insurers, all came together and said that they were dedicated to um, the energy transition, the net zero transition. Um, all of this has been incredibly swift in many ways, and yet we are still not seeing the sorts of trillions of dollars of financial capital flowing in anything like the way that it needs to, uh, to in order to, um, to really affect change or the sort of change that's needed. And I think it's that lack um, of capital flow coupled with uh, the ever more frightening examples of extreme weather, global energy crisis, war, all of the topics that were covered in the previous session that are set to make this year's COP in Egypt exceptionally fraught. So to look at what this means and where we go to from here, I'm very pleased to be joined by four highly expert speakers. Um, we have Julia Hoggett, who is Chief Executive of the London Stock Exchange. She was previously at the Financial Conduct Authority and before that held a number of roles um, at banks, including Bank of America, JP Morgan. Hubert Keller, to my immediate right, is a senior, manager partner, senior managing partner at Switzerland's Lombard Odier, the private banking group, where he leads the firm's work on sustainable investment. Uh, to his right, Abed Kamali is managing director for climate finance at Bank of America. He spent more than 30 years working on climate change and sustainable finance. Uh, and has been to more climate cops than um, I think he cares to remember. And finally, we have Dr. Ajit Patel, who is the Vice President of Investment Operations at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and he was previously Governor of the Reserve Bank of India until 2018. So each speaker I, um, will be making some remarks, as, uh, some opening remarks um, from their respective areas, and we'll then have a, a panel discussion about the points they raise, followed quite swiftly by um, audience Q&A, because um, uh, we do want to hear, obviously, from everybody here. Uh, don't forget, if you feel a tweet upon you at any time, 
use the hashtag WFEE and the Smith School account is at the Smith School. So um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Uber Keller, um, who is going to be talking about um, what's really needed to unlock the trillions of dollars of capital in the investment industry uh, in order to make the energy transition flourish. Thank you very much. I, I will just uh, use the podium because I have basically very, very few slides, which perhaps will help for the discussion. So um, thank you very much. It's a great privilege for me to participate to this panel. By way of very rapid introduction, Lombardier is an investment firm. So that's the only thing we do. We are looking after approximately $300 billion of, of client assets. And for us, sustainability has been a core investment conviction for some time now. We basically believe that the environmental transition is unfolding through effectively three major chapters. None of it will be a surprise to you. We think there's a very important energy chapter, there's a very, very important land and ocean, and there's a very important materials chapter. And we also believe that this economic transformation is likely to disrupt between 90 95% of our investment universe. And one of the key questions that we are asking ourselves and we keep asking ourselves is you know, how to position our clients' capital and how to deploy our clients' capital in front of what could be one of the most important economic transformation of all time. So our starting point, and this is really important, is an investment conviction. There are two ways that the financial sector can be involved in this transition. You can be ahead of it if you are an active asset manager, or you could be behind it or following it if you are an index tracker or a passive investment manager, and those, this is really an important distinction. Again, following on our investment conviction, we think that the transition is already well in motion. We, we think it's being pushed forward by extremely powerful forces. Um, a few important ones, probably the most important ones being cost curves and the start of, or the starting of the pricing of externalities, which is today a code word for the emergence of efficient carbon markets. So, what I will just try to do in a few minutes is share with you our perspective on what should be or what could be a robust sustainable investment framework, finding the key to designing uh, a, such a sustainable investment framework is basically the key to potentially unlock that huge amount of capital that is still sitting on the fence. Perhaps one of the most important points uh, which I'd like to address first is um, that confusion that we are facing as an industry, that there is a trade-off between financial returns and sustainable investing. So on the one hand, sustainable investing is about deploying capital in companies that are accelerating the transition and avoiding those companies that are either slowing down or harming the transition. This is an important dimension, but this is a dimension, dimension of impact. But also, on the other hand, sustainable investing is about identifying companies that stand to benefit financially, so financially benefit from the transition and avoiding those that may financially suffer from it. This is a really important distinction because as an investment industry, this is where our fiduciary duties lie. So we are extremely focused on that second dimension. The first dimension is about portfolio alignment. The second dim dimension is about investment return. So very quickly, let me give you our own perspective on these two dimensions. Starting with alignment. So this is where we are in trying to assess whether a company is sustainable or not. Now, we are unfortunately not helped because as an industry, we have been working with effectively what we all know the ESG framework, I would refer to as the ESG 1.0 framework, and I would also, unfortunately, admit that this framework is absolutely not fit for purpose. Why? Because it's relying on a vast amount of ESG data that is aiming to basically assess, whether a, uh, assess the environmental footprint of a company, but it's failing to basically assess whether a company is active in the right or wrong activities. That is ESG 1.0. Under this framework, by the way, 
Most companies are sustainable. So it's a very convenient framework for industry to use because we can basically build lots of sustainable portfolio. And as you can see right now, we are under severe attack, quite rightly, about on greenwashing issues. Now, fortunately, the regulators are forcing us now to move to ESG 2.0, which basically involves adopting an activity-based assessment framework. And that is basically going to make a huge difference because from now on, or from next year on, we are going to need to think whether, um, we're going to need to look, assess whether a company is sustainable based on whether its own activities is making a substantial or meaningful contribution to the transition, while, of course, uh, limiting its environmental and social footprint. So that is basically ESG 2.0. It's good news because it's going to basically um, uh, deal, perhaps, a lot with the greenwashing issue. Now, the problem with ESG 2.0, or with this framework, is that suddenly our sustainable investment universe is shrinking dramatically. Because the reality is that as we are assessing companies under this framework, there are going to be very few companies today out there that are going to be deemed sustainable. Why? Simply because the wider economy, as we all know, is far from being sustainable today. So here's the problem. If our investment universe is shrinking, you know, at Lombardy, we have a 300 billion capital deployment issue. So how are we going to uh, deploy capital at scale? But this is nothing compared to our friends, and we are part of them, in the GFANS Alliance that have signed up to deploy 130 trillion capital. So this is a big problem which the industry is trying to tackle. And, one of the, um, and we would suggest that one way to um, deal with it is to basically adopt a more judgmental and forward-looking assessment framework. Because the reality is that many companies today are not sustainable, but many companies have actually in place a very credible transition plan. And many companies are also on the right transition trajectory. That will basically broaden up our sustainable investment framework on the one hand and deploy capital where it needs to go. So that was for the alignment dimension. I will move now on to the return dimension. Here we are asking ourselves a completely different question. This is about how economic systems are likely to change as a result of the transition, how value chain across industries are likely to be disrupted, how profit pools will shift, and when and what are going to be the key inflection points. This is basically a very complicated uh, question, far more complex than the first one. This is highly judgmental. Many investment firms will have different views about it. It will create a very healthy divergence of views, and it's ultimately all about investment returns. What are the companies that stand to financially benefit from the transition? And what are those that stand to suffer? I just want to give you and leave you, um, um, getting towards the end, so leave you with one interesting example of the automotive industry to illustrate that different dimension than alignment. We all agree, or probably we all agree, that the net zero roadmap for the automotive sector is a shift towards electrical vehicles, and it's about producing less cars. Otherwise, uh, we are not going to be meeting the dematerialization objectives which is one of the important chapters of the transition. So if we are going to, um, so the way that we are going to be looking at an, auto, an automotive company to see whether it's aligned, we are basically going to, um, uh, we're going to want to see it uh, moving rapidly towards electrical vehicles and also improving circularity. That automotive company potentially for us it's al is aligned. But the real question is, that for this same automotive company to perform financially, it needs to make sure that it is well exposed to the emerging and shifting profit pools. If that same automotive company, in face of the transition, stays just a car manufacturing company, it will actually suffer because margin electrical vehicles are likely to be lower, point one, and point two, because the overall size of the market is also going to be shrinking. But this company has an opportunity to tap into many different profit pools, ranging from getting involved in the EV charging infrastructure network, in power generation, power distribution, in fleet management, in battery technology or battery manufacturing. As a result of the transition, basically the automotive industry value chain is changing very fundamentally, and it's opening up a, a, a wide range of different and new profit pools. 
And this is where I'll, I'll uh, and this is, by the way, starting to be priced by the market. Everybody is asking why Tesla is uh, uh, so highly valued. I really don't have an answer for that. But what I can tell you is that when I look at basically Toyota with a nearly 250 billion market cap against Tesla with nearly a trillion dollar market cap, it is interesting that whilst Toyota is selling 10 times more cars than Tesla, actually, Tesla is extremely well positioned to capture these new profit pools. And this is the investment um, dimension that we're trying to, to bring forward. So anyway, to conclude, um, if we are going to be trying to unlock capital at scale, we would suggest that it is important that we, are, we, we go about trying to design a fairly robust, clear, and transparent in sustainable investment framework. Um, we think it should be articulated across these two dimensions. They are important. We don't think that um, they go one against the other. We think that there will be tensions. So we will see companies that are extremely poorly aligned, i.e. very dirty, but tend to benefit financially from the transition, ref reference to a copper mining company. But these would be minorities. In fact, in most cases, we're going to see alignment and financial returns quite closely connected. And we'll see a very, hunting, a very fertile hunting ground in basically the upper side of the, of the chart. And there will be also lots of gray area of companies moving in the right direction, but not yet completely aligned, but with a business model that is extremely fit for this uh, major economic transformation. So by way of introduction, this is basically what I want to say. I think there is potential, if we get this right, to basically uh, channel a huge amount of capital going forward. Thank you so much, Hubert. That's, um... That's so interesting. Um, and, and I'm particularly struck by this idea that um, ESG 2.0 is something that's going to really revolutionize um, the, the flow of funds. And I just wonder, if you've got a sense of the sort of time frame? You know, when do you think we're actually going to be seeing that fully in place? Because not every part of the world, uh, not all regulators in every part of the world are moving at the same pace. So, no, I think it's a very good question. I th it's, it's happening now, right now. So, as of this summer, under MIFID regulation, um, um, investment firms, and uh, particularly uh, in Europe, are required to ask their uh, end clients their sustainability preferences. Um, then, as part of SFDR, the new EU regulation, um, there is, going to, there is now a clear definition of what a sustainable investment is, and it is heavily based on the EU taxonomy framework, which is the activity-based framework. So effectively, I would say between now and the next sort of six to 12 months, the shift is really happening. And it's going to have, it's, you know, it's going to be potentially quite a big wake-up call for asset owners. So just to give you an example, if you use the EU taxonomy alignment as a framework, the um, MSCI world, which is one of the extensively used uh, market benchmark, the MSCI uh, world, ESG index. And these ESG index are currently the ones that are driving the 30 to $35 trillion of uh, ESG investing. The ESG index is less than 7% taxonomy aligned. So, uh, that's basically another way of saying that 93% of the ESG index um, is not uh, aligned uh, to the transition. Right, that's really quite, quite, a, quite a gap there. Yeah. It's a bit of a gap. Very interesting. Um, well, thank you very much for, um, for just setting out what we can expect to see from um, the regulation that's coming down the pike. Abed, can you now um, give us a sense of um, how Bank of America has been dealing with, uh, or some of the experiences you've had with climate finance and um, what's been working, what hasn't, and what needs to change? Yeah, thanks, Peter. So actually, I'll cover a couple of different topics in my opening remarks. The first, just to pick up on the, you know, the first session, um, give, give you a view from a, from a bank, you know, how, how has the war in Ukraine affected the transition, the speed of the transition? Um, secondly, you know, we, we have a very strong view at the bank that the public and the private finance sectors have to work really strongly together, and it's great that we've got represent, representation from the, um, you know, the MDBs here as well, uh, but we've got, perhaps an evolving view of what the needs are, uh, or what the asks are, I should say, 
um, of the private finance sector from the public sector, so I'll try to give some of that. And then the third is really just insights from our own, you know, we've got a, a $1.5 trillion uh, commitment to mobilize um, uh, you know, that amount of, of sustainable finance by 2030. And as we've deployed capital, as we engage with clients, both corporates and investors, um, you know, issues emerge that I think are important to, to articulate that may impede our collective success. So this is a chance to throw those out for the, for the debate. Okay, so in terms of you know, the momentum, and you know, we heard a great discussion, so I'm not gonna dive too much into it. Perhaps simplistically, we've gone from you know, Glasgow's green glow to Vladimir's vindictive volatility with energy and, and food uh, pricing um, you know, bearing the brunt of it. And, and obviously, it's the emerging markets that will, will feel that the most. Uh, in terms of um, you know, other impacts, well, supply chains are getting uh, you know, reshored, friendshored. You know, that's creating some interesting dynamics in the markets. Um, and, and then the other point is, obviously, central banks have a much more different challenge than they've been used to, which is for the first time in a long time, they're having to uh, make difficult trade-offs with, uh, with growth versus inflation. And we haven't seen that uh, debate. So, so what does all this mean? Well, specifically implications for you know, how fast we're going to net zero, I would say the first one is uh, you know, the transition is likely to be uh, more disorderly than we expected. And I think we have to be brutally honest about that. Uh, you know, carbon, high carbon assets are likely to be sweat for longer. Uh, the second point is governments will actually have less capital to allocate to climate action Again, I think it's important to be brutally honest about that. You know, Liz Truss was in New York yesterday. She talked about um, ramping up our defense spending. You know, there is, a, there is not an unlimited supply of capital, um, I think, although, you know, we'll have to see what the chancellor says today. Um, uh, but, um, you know, and then the third point is uh, supply chains are, are actually going to be perhaps the critical determining, the rate determining step in terms of how fast we can really go on, on to net zero. And I think it was either at the coffee or on the session, I can't remember now, but we've had some discussion about the, the importance of rare earth metals and you know, specifically you know, who holds which, you know, access to which resources. So the, you know, those are the observations on, on the road to net zero. In terms of the public sector and the private sector, and you know, perhaps to pr provoke some debate, I'll say, I think the private sector is probably more committed to net zero at this stage. And, and why is that? Well, we don't have the luxury of prevaricating on our commitments. Yeah, you know, we've made commitments. Polita, you talked about the you know, GFANS, as it's known. Um, roughly 450 institutions making commitments to net zero by 2050 across all scopes of emissions. And in the case of the banking sector, you know, having to already uh, publish our 2030 sector-specific targets. These are, uh, you know, these, these are showing pretty significant reductions in emissions in the portfolio. Governments, well, we've heard not too much, if I can say, you know, since Glasgow. Um, you know, we heard in the earlier session about uh, the, the uh, commitment at Glasgow to come up with enhanced national strategies, NDCs in the jargon. I think it's probably only fair to say, you know, Australia, India, to some degree, UAE just last week have come up with genuinely, you know, material enhancements in the NDC. So that, that is, is some worry. Um, why is this relevant? Well, you know, when we think about the kind of total amount of investment that's required and the six trillion per year number, let's use that, I think that's the IEAs, uh, you know, to stay Paris aligned, you know, let, let, let's break it down into what specifically we need. Well, you know, if you strip out what is commercially viable, renewables and the like, you know, transitions that the automakers are already making to electric vehicles, um, and you strip out, uh, let's call it a reallocation of capital within China, because they don't really need access to outside capital, um, it's, it, you know, it's about one to two trillion a year to stay Paris aligned. In, and, and, and that finance is, uh, that capital is needed in um, middle income and, and low income countries. So, you know, let's break that down further. There's probably three different types of capital where the public and the private need, need to somehow figure out how to work together. So the first is blended finance, and that's gonna be the, the, uh, the public sector providing the con concessional funding that will ho hopefully pull through private capital to follow. 
The second is um, where the multilateral development banks have a significant role in financing specific low carbon assets and infrastructure. And there, it's really important for them to have private capital mobilization as, as really a core piece of their mandate, which is something that's lacking today. And the third is not really investment. It's more about grants and subsidies. And you know, those grants and subsidies, which could be, by the way, through the, the carbon credit markets, if the compliance market gets going, or maybe the voluntary market takes on a trajectory that, is, um, you know, that, that many hope it might, uh, and it's to address probably three specific areas that aren't commercially viable. No one would really invest in accelerated coal phase out. Nobody is really investing in um, avoided deforestation. It's this category of investment that's, that's needed, but it's, it, it's not something that is attracting commercial capital. And then the third is you know, some of the longer term technology. Somebody raised them earlier. Uh, direct air capture and you know, next generation carbon dioxide removal, which is you know, way up on the, on the marginal abatement cost curve. So, you know, how, the, I mean, the common thread, to cut to the chase, the common thread for all of those three specific areas is we need, um, you know, we, we need to see something closer to a 10x leveraging of capital compared to the less than one that we're seeing now in terms of, you know, public to private. Okay, the last point to close um, is really, you know, s some issues that we see coming up in our engagements with clients. And you know, perhaps this is a, a personal plea that we need to be more inclusive in our discussions about the transition. The first is inclusiveness on technology. It, it's always amazing to me that some of the technologies like carbon capture use and storage and nuclear can't really find space to, you know, to, to, um, to, to, to generate ideas and to generate um, you know, discussions. And we see some of that in the cops you mentioned you know, the, the, the hundreds of cops I've been to. Um, it, it's amazing, nuclear is often shunned, uh, uh, you know, at those cop meetings, which is surprising given last time I checked, it was a, you know, zero carbon um, source and is in the IPCC's uh, recommended list of technologies. The, the second is inclusiveness about the aspirations of developing countries. And this is an interesting one because, you know, most of the models we see don't really have growth in emissions anticipated for most of the low and middle income countries. There's an assumption that somehow the available carbon budget is gobbled up by you know, OECD and the larger uh, developing countries. Um, and I think that's totally unrealistic and you know, do it doesn't align with this principle of a just transition. And then the third, and you know, this is probably you know, coming off three years of La Nina, uh, I think we have to be brutally honest about the physical impacts of climate change and how you know, uh, what we've seen in Pakistan and California and Germany, and I don't need to list all the countries, you know, it, it's, it is going to have an impact on um, economic growth trajectories. How we factor that into, you know, models and uh, decision making, I leave that to other experts, but I just wanted to throw it out for the discussion. Thank you. Just, just before we hear from our next speaker, Albert, I really want to ask you about um, the comment that you made about the private sector being more committed than the public sector to net zero, which I, is something that I, we hear quite a bit of. But I have to ask you, um, particularly since you're from Bank of America, and the FT yesterday we had a story saying that Bank of America was one of about three or four banks that was actually worried about being able to stay in GFANS because of the concern about being sued over some of their, the commitments being made on climate change. So I know you can't speak for the entire bank, but really, you know, I mean, are we about to see the exodus of a number of the most important members of GFANS, do you think, as climate commitments get tougher? So, I mean, and look, I have to be very candid here. I, you know, I can't publicly comment on something where we actually haven't publicly commented. So I think, you know, we've been perhaps a little bit surprised to see uh, what's been reported. Um, I think it's fair to say there's a healthy debate going on within GFANS. You know, some of this relates to um, governance structures that we're all having to, to learn. You know, you've got race to zero, which seems to be, you know, uh, uh, coming out of the COP movement itself. And then you have GFANS, which is an umbrella group actually for the Net Zero Banking Alliance and then the Net Zero Asset Managers and all the other ones. Yeah, service providers too. So there are actually five different 
net zero um, alliances which together sit within GFANs. So my own personal view is I think this is, you know, it's a little bit of governance who, you know, Bank of America, like other banks, presumably only signed up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Uh, so let's figure out what the governance looks like and who can set the rules and conditions and all of that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, just reading uh, what's been said, you, one can kind of understand that, um, okay, that there, there may be legal, legal problems, potentially, that, you know, a, a financial institution could open itself up to to lawsuits if it doesn't meet certain commitments. But, but I wonder, you know, to some extent, is it possible that um, that's really almost a smokescreen? It's, it's an argument that's being deployed because banks really don't want to have to, for example, forsake fossil fuel clients earlier than they might otherwise have, have to in order to meet, say, a, a, net, a 2030 net zero um, commitment. Or, or is that being overly... Uh, unfair and cynical. No, I, I mean, look, I think there is a healthy debate going on um, about uh, what credible transition plans look like. And, you know, Hubert, I think you, you pointed to this as well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's you know, I think there are, uh, e even, even large fossil fuel companies have um, differing degrees of credibility in their transition plans. They have uh, different business portfolios, they have different geographical um, footprints, and you know, their transition over 2050 is gonna look different. Um, yeah. We, as, as a global financial institution, are likely to be touching some of those clients in different ways, and it's, it's you know, I think we, we have to just be very clear that we have, we can provide the financing that's required to make sure that the transition is happening in a smooth way and not in a disorderly way, which is one of the points I made earlier. Right. Because I think it's a, you know, we, we hear a lot about these uh, fossil fuel companies and, and how, how bad they are and whether we should continue to finance them or not. Um, of course, from an asset management perspective, it's about investing in them. But the reality is that you have, you have the greening of the supply, you have the greening of the demand, and the two have to move in sync. So, you know, actually, the big oil and gas companies are probably the biggest source of investment in renewables as, that we have today. And I think if you speak to some of them, you know, they would love to be able to accelerate the deployment of capital towards renewables, but that basically means that they're gonna be producing more en uh, renewable energy supply. If you don't have green energy demand on the, other, on the other side, you're basically creating a mismatch in the market and you're creating price disruption in effectively what you see today in the oil, oil uh, or potentially in the oil and gas uh, uh, market, and you have a cost of living issue. So it's, it's uh, you know, to, to go back to what has just been said, I think they, one has to look at the transition plan of these big fossil fuel companies and see how credible it is, and then try to support them as opposed to just divest and avoid, and avoid the financing of them. Okay, well, I suspect this is something that's going to come up in uh, Q&A. So let's move to our next speaker. Um, Julia, tell us what is happening at the London Stock Exchange, because I know, um, in fact, uh, you've been doing some extremely uh, interesting things that possibly hasn't had quite as much attention as it might have otherwise, and this is your chance now to... There's my us. chance to sing all about it. Um, so firstly, thank you, everybody, for having me. I'm not going to stand up, um, because if I stood behind that, you wouldn't see me. Um, <laughs> so let me cover a few things. Firstly, I just want to pick up on some of the themes that have come out of this. Um, one of our biggest problems, it isn't the biggest problem, because the biggest problem is climate change. One of our biggest problems in addressing climate change is the alphabet soup of acronyms that's been created. Um, because we haven't been very good at describing what those acronyms are actually serving and what they're doing. I have a very simple way of thinking about it. We have an aspiration at the London Stock Exchange, and I have set my team an exam question, which is how do we make ESG BAU by 2025? Um, if you think about the way capital markets function, they function on the basis of the understanding of the net present value of future cash flows. It's the largest way of what's just been talked about. How do we think about the ability to evaluate every asset through the lens of the net present value of future cash flows adjusted for their impact on the planet. Now, if you actually look at what came out of COP, more of the architecture that exists in the way of capital markets function today to enable us to do that has actually been put in place or has been developed than people realize. But what they hear is acronym soup. They don't realize that that's what's actually happening. 
So in the UK, we now have TCFD as mandated for listed issuers. So you have to disclose according to the Task Force of Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And we were the first stock exchange in the world to put the guidance out for listed issuers on our venue as to how you do that. But the other facet of that is we work with the UN Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative because the biggest exchanges in the world have got together under the auspices of the UN to make sure that we all try and raise the bar as coherently and consistently at the same time as possible so that large pools from capital can't migrate elsewhere without being held similarly accountable. From next year, you will have to publish transition plans in the UK if you're an asset owner or a listed issuer. And that goes to the 2.0 piece. That goes to how do you not just engage with what a company has done, but actually how a company governs its risks, thinks about its risks, identifies its risks, and then manages its risks. And one of the things we've done as a stock exchange is we made a large charitable donation to the um, TPI at the Grantham Institute at the other LSE at the London School of Economics, um, which is fundamentally about evaluating the transition plans of what were 400 companies going to 10,000. And one of the requirements of our charitable donation is that information is made freely available. Because that ability to interrogate the transition plans of companies and what work they're actually doing to go forward will be a vital part of understanding value going forward. When you add in the ISSB so that we actually have proper auditing standards, um, then you get to a point which is exactly what Arad said, which is when I was talking about the voluntary carbon markets at COP, and I'll come on to that, um, I was talking to some politicians who basically said, Actually, what the people don't realise or the public discussion doesn't realise is if you're the CEO of a listed company and you have made this commitment, it's not voluntary at that point. You will be held to it by the investors within GFANS and elsewhere. And it feels as real as any other part of the commitment that you've made to the market. That is going to last outlast significantly outlast election cycles. Um, and therefore, actually, the value of corporations making net zero, science-based net zero commitments and then having to publish transition plans is very, very meaningful. But it's not really necessarily understood through that lens. So we are building the architecture for that. I'm a former regulator and I believe in pipes and plumbing and I think they matter. And there's rather more pipes and plumbing in place than people give it credit for. In terms of what we're doing at the Stock Exchange, we think about it through three lenses. The first is how do we direct capital into the green economy and into the transition? Uh, now, uh, Gil Scott Heron would probably be um, spinning in his grave, but I have stolen one of his phrases, uh, which is that the transition must be televised. Um, and the key reason for that is there is enough capital right now that could sweat dirty assets and direct none of the profits from that back into the transition. But actually, if you're doing that out loud in public, on public markets, with the disclosure disciplines that we talk about, you've got a better chance of holding people to actually reinvesting in the transition and holding them to it. Um, and that's the pragmatic reality, because unless, if there wasn't enough capital out there privately, we wouldn't have this issue, but we do. Um, so, and I view, and I think that may be a view you hold as well, that actually um, the transition to net zero is the stewardship challenge of our generation. And investors have a very active role to play in holding companies account for what they do. So we are focused on financing both the green economy and the transition. We have a sustainable bond market, a transitional bond market, and a green economy mark to identify those companies that are genuinely focused on green environmental revenues. Um, and actually, the interesting thing is the number of those companies that are very much increasingly involved in the circular economy. But we're also looking at where value changes in its understanding, and it is created differently as a consequence of this transition. And it goes back to another point that was made about articulating the value of carbon. It's, it's really putting a price on it, let's be blunt. Um, the voluntary carbon markets that we are building and we're launching in the next two weeks um, fundamentally will drive, and we hope will drive, large volumes of capital into the projects that generate voluntary carbon credits. Now, voluntary carbon credit cannot be created by activity that isn't additional and would happen anyway. So you can't build a wind farm off the north coast of the UK with a viable offtake price from the grid and get a voluntary carbon credit from it. Because people are doing that already. We've just opened one of the largest, if not the largest, wind farm in the world um, in the last few weeks. Um, so that has to be additive stuff that wouldn't happen otherwise. If you're an investor in that activity, how do you have the confidence to invest in it if the value that comes out of it is a voluntary carbon credit if there isn't a deep and liquid voluntary carbon market? How do you create a deep and liquid voluntary carbon market unless you've actually got a flow of projects that will deliver you the carbon credits that create the depths to the market? 
Most other venues have been focusing on what I would describe as nickel and diming the trading of voluntary carbon credits. It doesn't solve the chicken and egg problem that actually directs the capital into those projects. So we are launching a market in two weeks' time that will enable us to direct the capital into those projects. And those new markets will continue to develop as value transforms across the ecosystem. The next point is that our job is to drive dialogue between issuers, investors and policymakers. I often say, have a soapbox, we'll use it. As, given my height, I need it as well, but it's a different manner. Um, and therefore, making sure that we're advocating for the things that need to be thought about. And sometimes we can do that as a bit of an independent practitioner. Um, one of the challenges of the European rules um, and the issue that's been raised about directional capital to the global south, and I said this at COP and I will be, I'll say it again, the global capital markets have been really good at directing flows between the global north. For many, many years, they've been utterly rubbish at directing flows to the global south. And therefore, one of the things the voluntary carbon market can do, because it generates actual projects in the global south, is think about how value can be transformed and moved within private sector um, or private market articulations. Um, and that is something that I think we need to continue to explore. But we also need to make sure that we don't just make rules for the transition that work really well when applied to established markets in the global north and don't work very well in the global south. And one of the concerns about setting the diktats of, of the European rules is actually it will freeze capital into the global south because the disciplines and the data and the disclosure that asset managers need to prove that they've got, they won't be able to find. Um, and so we need to think about genuinely, truly global solutions to these things. I don't mind saying that. It's slightly harder for other parts of that ecosystem to say it. And then the final point is how do we make sure that we're driving the right data? This is, I mean, if we think about the amount of data that markets consume already, the amount of data that you need to consume to actually genuinely understand the transition is far greater. And it is evolving at different paces, um, and it needs to get more discipline behind it, and it needs to get more scrutiny behind it, but we need to recognise that this will evolve. The final piece for me that matters is, if this were easy, we'd have done it already. Markets like systems, they like processes, they like rules, they like established procedures. We are, this is a, this is the ultimate definition of a wicked problem. We know where we want to go. By the time we get there, we'll be in a completely different place than we are today or that we thought we were in the plan. And therefore, the system and the ecosystem needs to be able to evolve and cope with that complexity. And it needs to be able to realise that there are things we'll invest in today that we think are the moonshot solution to some, some part of the problem, and they won't work. We need to recognise that this will be an evolving piece. Too often, this discussion is made very binary. And it's made binary between investing in sustainability versus kind of cost of living crisis, and I understand that. Um, but I think we need to try and do our best to avoid making it binary and avoid, um, um, avoid kind of simplifying too much and recognising that we need to not set in stone too many things that we presume are right now because they won't be. And that is a fundamental challenge for markets that operate on the basis of kind of controls and systems. The final thing I'd say is this is where physics and finance meet. Um, and when I was at the FCA, I am afraid partially responsible for the fact that TCFD is mandatory in the UK. And when I had to think about supervising it, I had to ask myself a very simple question. Do I hire a whole load of climate scientists and turn them into corporate finance geeks, or do I take my existing corporate finance geeks and turn them into climate scientists? We need to embed this thinking in every discipline we can think of. Because fundamentally, if you're a technologist and you've got to build a new data center, you've got to think about the carbon footprint of it. If you're managing supply chains and you're buying pencils, you need to think about the carbon footprint of it. Every single part of managing a business to keep this thoroughly integrated in how we operate will need a skill set and a capability that we're not automatically mapping into the capabilities and the way we teach people. This is why this sort of conference and these sorts of conversations are critical. But we need to think about that. I want somebody who cares passionately about the climate to grow up wanting to be a banker or wanting to work for the exchange because they think they can drive change in the climate by doing so. And at the moment, we don't quite make that connection, I don't think. I'll stop ranting. Thank you. Um, I think you've hit a very large nail on the head there with um, the, this, by identifying that, that issue of whether we turn climate scientists into financial experts and vice versa, and it's such an interesting one and um, one that's going to run and run. Can I just, before mm -hmm. um, we move on to Asia, can I just ask you one thing about the voluntary carbon market measures yep. that you're introducing? I think they're super interesting, but I also know that a lot of people are going to be saying, well, okay, 
you know, last year we saw even really large companies like Microsoft, one of the most committed climate um, uh, com groups in the world, really, when, when it comes to corporate climate policy. Um, even they had managed to invest in carbon credits that were based on projects in forests that were raised by wildfires in North America. Uh, how are you going to ensure that the credits that are going to be generated from the projects that are linked to the LSCs, voluntary yep. carbon markets, measures are not going to suffer similar fates? I'm not certain you can fully say um, that any part of the planet is going to be safe from the climate effects. I mean, that by definition is in a sense the very thing you're trying to mitigate. The, the rationale for the way we've done it, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of detail, try and insert as little technical as possible. Um, what we are doing is creating designation in the fund market and the operating company market in the exchange. That is using the exact standard rules that already exist if you're a listed company. Okay, So the disclosure rules, the transparency rules, and the market abuse rules that you've already got, you have to apply. That fund will then direct capital into those projects and can then either pay a dividend in cash if it generates any, or a dividend in specie as a carbon credit. One of the biggest criticisms that has existed of the voluntary carbon market to date is twofold, I think. One is, it's no substitute for the hard yards of decarbonisation of your supply chain and your production process. We totally agree. And the reason we have the confidence to do that now in the UK is because we've got mandatory TCFD and because we'll have mandatory transition plans for next year. So investors will genuinely be able to scrutinise how much is hard yards of direct work that companies are doing and how much is investing in carbon credits to resolve the issues that they can't solve for yet or to actually potentially have the capacity to invest in education investments in investments in education technologies. But that's one criticism, and we agree. But I think the UK framework puts it as an advantage anywhere in the world in terms of the way we think about the discipline disclosure around that question. The next issue is these are untransparent, OTC, nobody can talk about the price, um, it, there's lots of middlemen in between and without the big disciplines. What we managed to do by creating this market was we immediately brought the, the investment in projects that generate carbon credits in scope of the disclosure regime, the transparency regime and the market abuse regime. The FCA didn't need to do anything. They just had to agree that they were prepared to supervise it on that basis. So for the first time, I think you'll get to a point where you've got proper market disclosure disciplines around these investments. And I hope we get to a point, now commercially I hope so, but I also hope so for the planet, that actually I, I like thinking about client offerings through one very simple question. And that question is why would you not? If I can produce a product where the answer, the question really is why would you not do this because it's the sensible thing to do, then um, I think we've got somewhere. But I think the key question is going to be if you're a corporate investing in carbon credits to get to your net zero target, why would you not invest in the one that's actually got the disclosure that's on the public markets and subject to public market discipline? Why would you invest in something that's OTC and not transparent? And so the hope is that you're genuinely raising the bar. You're bringing in big asset managers, big professional project managers, and you're institutionalizing, to be honest, what has not been an institutional flow to date. So I think that's the hope around kind of the logic of the market. Okay, so that's really interesting because it really goes back to um, uh, the ESG 2.0 and the EU taxonomy and the SEC disclosure rules that are coming um, into being shortly. So in other words, we're going to see really quite a massive shift in regulation, in disclosure, transparency, uh, and other measures that are, are going to be potentially having quite an interesting effect, um, we hope, um, on, on financing. For, so, yeah, um, very interesting. Last but not least, Urjit, um, we've had uh, already in uh, the first session this morning a lot of interesting discussion about the role of multinational development banks. Um, tell us your thoughts on SAME uh, in general and on the AIIB in particular. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I will bring uh, two perspectives, one uh, developing countries uh, and, and secondly MDBs. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I only have about half a dozen slides so we'll move in quite quickly. Uh, uh, so the key questions uh, we want to ask ourselves uh, are the ones that the conference organizers uh, suggested uh, and uh, they are on that slide. Uh, but I think the credibility of answers to these have to be judged from the perspective of initial conditions. And, and that is partly what I will do. 
So I think the transition to net zero shouldn't uh, drive a bad corner solution for developing countries. I think otherwise many bets are off. And uh, <clears throat> the bar chart on the right is the per capita electricity consumption as a percentage of the world average. And I think it's good to keep this in mind uh, as, we, as we go forward. Uh, I don't think it's politically acceptable in any, any, any country, democratic or otherwise, uh, that anything will be sacrificed uh, uh, unless there is access to affordable and reliable energy, especially when you have countries like uh, Bangladesh where uh, the percentage compared to the world uh, consumption per capita is 14%, India is less than 40 and Kenya is 5%. So I think we need to we need to keep this in mind as we as we talk about uh, human welfare. Uh, this is the old abatement cost curve, which we can skip. Uh, the other issue, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's so I mean, it's a nice curve, but it's so over overwritten that uh, hardly anyone can read it. Um, uh, so um, yeah, I, I think the issue of taxation and investment are important. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that many countries already tax hydrocarbons very heavily. I mean, there are countries that generate revenues from this source of three, three and a half percent of GDP already. Uh, and I don't think you can directly tax petrol and diesel and aviation turbine fuel consumption heavily and then also tax consequent emissions from the same sources. Uh, imposing both fuel taxes and carbon taxes is double taxation. Uh, it, other, it undermines energy excess, affordability, and engenders a political backlash, which will be against the green agenda. So I think we need to be careful there. Uh, many, a lot of stuff out there suggests that, you know, the emissions taxes are the only taxes that are, uh, that is taxing carbon, not true. Uh, uh, fossil fuel taxes are also easy to collect, almost costless to administer, uh, and very little leakage. So, so, so governments like them uh, and it serves uh, more than one purpose. Uh, uh, taxing emissions directly is complicated, admin heavy, and there will be leakage for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, the investment requirements, of course, for uh, climate change mitigation remain high. Uh, and of course, and you know, these numbers are, are uh, are almost at the level of funny money, uh, you know, nine trillion per year on average, 275 trillion uh, for the next 30 years. Now what, uh, um, I'm new at AIB and um, uh, the climate financing at AIB uh, uh, is predicated that long tenor funds uh, is the main advantage of multilateral development banks. Uh, this can enhance risk taking capacity on the back of a global sovereign ownership, uh, 105 countries are shareholders. Uh, but capital is limited in relation to the requirements. Uh, at present, green finance is about 30% of total approved financing, uh, which is about just about $10 billion. Uh, and in terms of project numbers, it's actually in the majority. Uh, 92 out of 181 approved projects are in green finance. Uh, the bank has set an ambitious target of ensuring that 50% of overall approved financing by 2025 will be directed toward climate finance. Um, uh, <clears throat> and our current estimate is that cumulative climate finance approvals would be about 50 billion by 2030. AIB also invests uh, in secondary markets to create increase liquidity for climate financing. Uh, investing in funds that acquire low carbon assets uh, 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 via various platforms. I think if you look at the challenges, uh, as many people have said since 9.30 in the morning, uh, energy security uh, is, uh, has come front and center uh, uh, on account of, of events in Europe. Uh, uh, and energy security concerns may outweigh the carbon emissions reduction commitment. And I think almost every speaker has said that has already happened. I think in, in developing countries, uh, the government's fiscal space in this area is likely to be deployed 
for public goods with local benefits. Uh, and that is essentially an adaptation. Flood control, drainage, sea walls, tackling water scarcity because that improves people's lives straight away. And, and that's what people require uh, as, as, uh, as, we, as, we, as we move forward into a more uh, volatile climate situation. Uh, the debt sustainability in emerging economies is also an issue. Uh, there is already high indebtedness of EMs and the pandemic didn't help. Uh, 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 but developed countries are offering global capital market as a solution to financing needs. Now this just increases indebtedness. Uh, there are only three ways of doing of financing anything. Debt, equity, or credit enhancement. And credit enhancement is a form of contingent liabilities. By the yardstick of debt sustainability, the role of innovative finance, one way or the other, can only be, I think, a small part of the finance for the transition. Amidst all this, we also have to beware of greenwashing by opportunistic investors. I think the risk of moral hazard in this area is very high because information and asymmetry is large, and there are bandwagon effects. Uh, 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 not only commercial sectors, but development finance is also subject to the risk of greenwashing. Uh, and ESG regulatory gaps in terms of execution exist widely. Uh, the accounting of ESG credentials for projects with blended financing could be a challenge. It needs to weigh the pros and cons of focusing on the direct impact of assets acquired versus ex expanding the ESG credentials to participate in the financing. Uh, and, and how. Uh, is this a case of mission creep, perhaps? Uh, and if these broader credentials are to be taken into account, what data is available on which to make that call? At the moment, very little. Uh, and I, you know, if, you, if you talk to people at the International Sustainability uh, Standards Board and other affiliated institutions for the insurance market, capital markets, data is a huge problem. And uh, I was in a seminar a few weeks ago, and they said the most reliable way of keeping people honest is actually the whistleblower. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, formal data is, is, is a huge problem. So I think, I think we need to be very careful there and not, uh, not uh, be part of the bandwagon. Uh, I, I've also just done uh, some number crunching. I, I, uh, just to, uh, to fix ideas that if the promises that had been made in 2009 by developed economies to developing ones had been capped uh, at 100 billion per year, and if these were in solar PV through grants, from the decade from 2011 to 2020, accumulated emissions reduction could have been two and a half billion tons as compared to coal-fired power and 1.6 billion tons uh, 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 as compared to natural gas-fired power. Uh, the blue curve shows the potential reduction of solar power uh, emissions as a percentage of total emissions, global emissions in that year. And that shows the power of compounding, uh, that by this time, uh, every year it would have been almost 1.8% lower uh, if, if this had been done. Uh, the exercise was done in a very simple form, um, <clears throat> and the percentage of potential COT, um, COT emissions reduction actually increased in a parabolic fashion as the cost of solar PV dropped. <clears throat> this is the last slide. What are the conclusions that I, from my limited experience in this area, I think that we will, we will have to respect eclectic pathways uh, there is no one size fits all, and I think the, uh, the, the, the nationally determined contributions uh, in a general form are a good way to go forward. I don't think we should become zealots and say this way and one way is the only way to move forward and, and, and not lecture each other. Uh, uh, most countries are, uh, are on board that this has to be done, and they have signed up. Uh, the debt-driven green agenda on shoulders of developing countries doesn't have legs. Uh, uh, capital constraint in developing countries and debt sustainability is a tension. If we accept this, innovative finance can only do so much and perhaps be harmful for macro financial stability if unregulated. Remember, 
that much of energy is a non-tradable. The revenues that you earn is in domestic currency. So that the idea that you can borrow large amounts of foreign capital denominated in, 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 in dollar uh, and, and use that to service a, a revenue stream which is essentially in a domestic currency is, uh, uh, is problematic. And that's why, as, as someone mentioned, I think the previous speaker, that uh, there is very little not to south on this. Uh, and, and that's for a good reason. Uh, uh, I think to achieve the net zero transition, promised fiscal support by advanced economies to emerging economies has to materialize. Then innovative finance can help. For example, external grants and fiscal support of 100 billion per year can be used as equity and this could catalyze up to 100 to 200 billion additionality per year. Uh, and and, 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 then that, and you know, that, then you are looking at numbers that, uh, that, that reduce emissions very quickly. Uh, one issue uh, uh, that was put forward in several of the uh, G20 meetings at the deputies level, including by India, was on the two-part pricing for sharing mitigation technology uh, with developing countries, and this can be part of the fiscal support. And that basically means you split up the cost uh, 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 of, of any technology uh, or any, any machinery that helps with mitigation, including solar panels, better batteries, into the, into the cost that is attributed to the IPRs and the cost that is attributed to the materials that is used uh, in, in, in these. And, and perhaps the, and the cost of IPRs can be the fiscal support that it is waived. Uh, so in the end, it frankly boils down to a significant extent implementation of the touchstone of common but differentiated historical responsibilities for depletion of the nature endowed carbon budget. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ajit. There's uh, uh, about 15 questions um, that arise immediately. Um, that very interesting presentation. I just, just take one. Um, the point you make about um, the green agenda not being, it's not going to be possible to um, impose a debt driven green agenda on the shoulders of developing countries. Um, and it's a very real tension that has been there for a long time, but has really been exacerbated, I think, probably this year um, in many ways, particularly when we see uh, European countries racing to, say, build more LNG terminals and imp import more sources of non-Russian gas. At the same time as, you know, just this week, we've seen the head of another MB MDB, um, the European Investment Bank, saying that they're not going to be supporting fossil fuels in the future, not even gas. Um, which, of course, is something that a lot of developing countries um, are very concerned about and would really like to be able to, to uh, exploit. I, I wonder, what's your view? What's, what's the AAIB's view on whether gas can continue to be supported as a transition fuel or whether there needs to be a cut-off point relatively soon? So let me, you know, this issue came up in the morning also. I think... <laughs> If you look at the, if you exclude the European multilateral banks, which are very large, EIB and EBRD, and you look at the multilateral banks that essentially uh, have the developing countries as clients, the amount of money as a percentage of the investments that go into oil and gas investments globally from these banks is minuscule. It would be at the second decimal place, okay, because, I mean, the, the investments that are required in oil and gas are so large. I mean, uh, you know, he is he, a banker who has financed a lot of oil and gas, and he can give you the numbers on that. So the AIB's view on natural gas is that if it's a transition fuel for developed countries, it's a transition for developing countries too. Yeah, I mean, it may be small, globally speaking, but um, in terms of the project's impact, in some countries, it, it's a very large impact, is it not? If an MDB gets behind a project, it can go ahead uh, and otherwise might not. So is, I, it, I, is I, that really the right comparison? I think in most developing countries, those who can afford, I mean, gas itself is not cheap anymore, who can afford LNG, I think capital markets other than the multilateral development banks will fund that because they see a revenue stream and they can service the debt. 
So I, I, I don't think that, that the MDBs have a very big role in this, but the view at AIB is that if natural gas is a transition fuel for developed countries, it is a transition fuel for developing countries. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's go to audience Q&A. Um, I am very sure that we'll have a number of questions, and yes, I can see one up the back, two up, oops, three, three on this side, one over here. Can we take at least three at a time um, and then put them to the panel? Hi, uh, Guy Wolf uh, from Marix. Um, there's a lot of talk uh, on the panel around how the sort of decarbonisation agendas around reductions and movements to lower carbon technologies and so on. But a critical part of net zero is, well, not, by definition, you're going to have to have removals as well because lower carbon isn't going to be enough. In fact, it's a strong argument why we need to be net negative if we're going to re return the sort of temperatures to reliable levels. I, you know. How does the world unlock financing for removals? Because I think that's an even bigger challenge than unlocking financing for reductions. Um, yeah, because you are literally sort of paying money to get no output, A. And then secondly, another huge challenge, I think, is where does the supply of credible removal opportunity come from? Because a lot of carbon capture technology is super sensitive to power prices and realistically yeah, it's probably heavily set back over the last 12 months. So that's, that would be my main questions. Good question. Yep. Thank you. A million questions. It's Claire Perry O'Neill. Um, brilliant. Um, but I guess the key question, which gets back to the case that was made about how do we make equivalent cash data and ESG data is, for me, the key one. And I think, as you all illustrated, cash is not subject to global pathways and ideological debates about taxonomies or nuclear or carbon capture. And with you know, 87 months to go to 2030, how do we create the currency of greenhouse gas emissions reduction as the main focus, what we should actually be pricing both, both within the boardroom and the market and in government balance sheets? Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman in front of it. Hi, David Schuckman, journalist. Um, I'd like to follow up uh, Pilita's question to, to Abid about this FT coverage of the membership criteria, should we put it that way, of, of G fans. And I'm just really wondering, picking up Urgit's uh, comment about greenwash. I mean, I think you made a very powerful statement there. I, I mean, let me put this bluntly. Um, do you regard what might be seen as a bit of wriggling of the membership criteria for GFANS as a form of greenwash? Okay, and can I take one from this side? There was a, yes, down the front there. We can take that. Thank, you. Uh, thank you for a great panel. I'm Eric Beinhocker, uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking here at Oxford. Uh, my question is for Dr. Patel. Um, you discussed how the AIIB is increasing its investments to clean energy projects, which is very laudable, uh, but it still currently commits uh, $2 to fossil fuel projects for every $1 it's committing to clean energy projects. Uh, will the bank be making commitments to also ramp down uh, the commitments to fossil fuels over time? Uh, as its sister bank, the ADB, has done in, in uh, no longer uh, financing uh, coal projects. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, financing carbon removal, who'd like to tackle that? It's a really, again, yeah, Arvind. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, when, when we think about the getting to net zero, you have to shift from avoided emissions to uh, removals, and, you know, that's true even in the, in the carbon markets that, you know, were touched on here. Um, two of the biggest opportunity areas are things like, you know, nature-based solutions, where roughly... 80% of the opportunity set is actually in emerging markets, so that comes to the question that you know, has been raised here about how we get more capital flowing into emerging markets, and I think you know, it's, it, part of it is probably around creation of um, biodiversity markets, ecosystem uh, markets. You know, right now we only have carbon pricing in, I think it's about 17% uh, of, the, of the world's you know, carbon emissions, so we need to be uh, a bit more surgical there. In terms of some of the other technologies, the direct air capture, I think, you know, the, um, the recent passage of the, the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act is, is a step in the right direction. 
Tax credits have been incredibly successful in the US at, at ramping up investment into renewables. Um, hopefully, you know, the same would apply to some of the, you know, the, the, the next wave of uh, carbon dioxide removal technologies too. And I think you know, that, that needs to be replicated elsewhere. I think we need to get much more vocal about what foundational rules need to be put in place to make investing in these sorts of projects easier. So an awful lot of the um, carbon capture and removal, um, there's, there's a lot of questions about it, and, and, and there are some geophysical questions in terms of some of the solutions. Um, and it may take governments being prepared to underwrite some of that kind of future uncertainty in order to get private capital to go and invest in them. Um, and that's the bit that never gets part of the conversation. There's a conversation about the policies around the financing, but not around some of the underlying kind of issues around the practical matter of application of those technologies. Um, the, the other thing I'd say is I, I do hope that when we get to the Integrity Council and the definition of voluntary carbon credits, um, and I fully expect removal and reduction and removal will be in there, and the voluntary carbon market it, our hope is it will become a very big source of the providing of financing into those edge case technologies, because the generation of that activity will get you um, will get you your voluntary carbon credit, which is a new form of value that means that it gets over the threshold to be worth investing in. Um, so that is absolutely the the hope and the intent of the voluntary carbon market. Um, so I don't think anybody. Yes, we need to get corporates to to kind of remove or to reduce, but. Fundamentally, removal is always in there as well as reduce. Okay. Um, Ube, can you perhaps um, address both Claire's question about how we really embed greenhouse gas reduction into all forms of, of financing and, and David's question um, about whether really um, a loosening of GFAN's rules amounts to a fairly elaborate form of greenwashing? So I think the the I, I think the um, the reality is that the, the reality I'm confronted with um, in my day to day business is that as we go and as we go on and speak to CEOs of large companies of publicly listed companies, I continue to be literally amazed by how fast their climate agenda or how fast they are moving on the climate agenda. It, it, it is, this, this is really something that, you know, going back to the earlier comment that actually the private sector is probably more committed than the public sector, this is certainly something that we feel very, very much, you know, in our industry. Um, the, the reality is that big companies and generally publicly listed companies are making commitments. These commitments, um, are followed with, a, with often a very credible plan. Then they are communicating it, and then basically they are moving on uh, to implement it. Now, of course, there will always be, you know, to, to go back to um, a, a comment earlier this morning, the Exxon of this world, although, you know, one would argue that at some point they will also move in the right direction. But, you know, this has become a top board agenda topic. And, um, and I think we should not underestimate how fast things are actually moving in the world of sort of uh, public listed companies. Um, you know, there is a very simple question that, you know, any, frankly, research analyst who is following or having a discussion with a public listed company will have with a company, which is, where is, you know, uh, uh, what is the price that you're using for your carbon emissions? And you know, this price you know, used to be 25, it's moving up to 45, 50, and frankly, more and more people and young people are asking to companies to put in their model something like 150. So you know, the, the reality is that companies are confronted with this sort of embedded pricing of greenhouse gases emissions, and, and you know, a lot are trying to, to, to do something with them, with it. And, and those who are ignoring it, you know, will continue, will have a problem and will continue to, I think, uh, uh, be more and more starved from uh, capital allocation. I will just perhaps also come back to one of the earlier points on um, removal credit and the whole topic of carbon markets. 
I think there is, um, on the voluntary carbon market, I think there are some very interesting things that are, that are happening, and, and congratulations to the Non-Stock Exchange for all these great initiatives. We should not also underestimate the whole initiative going towards insetting, and again, going back to effectively these issues of net zero commitment for major companies. If we look at the consumer staples industry, basically, a lot of them now are starting to think very seriously about moving up the supply chain because you know, Nestle knows that they're gonna to have to deliver net zero coffee beans and that the only way to eventually deliver net zero coffee beans is to go up the supply chain and instead of relying on growers, actually own the land and basically grow coffee beans based on their own regenerative agricultural practices, which will do lots of you know, good things around capturing, sequestering carbon and so on and so forth. And it is the same for other uh, food manufacturing company, it is the same for the fashion industry, and so on and so forth. So these big net zero commitments, you know, are forcing companies to basically produce credible plan, implement them, and often go up and clean up their supply chain with some of the uh, impact on nature-based solutions. Okay. Um, yes. Abed and then Julia. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to, I mean, I think David addressed the question to me, so I felt like I, I should address it as well. Um, Look, I think you know our view is uh, the, the growth in ESG is you know is, is the best form of, of sunlight that the markets have. Um, Bank of America's view is that, in fact, ESG is still the strongest indicator of future earnings volatility for any given company. So, you know, our perspective is disclose, 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 and the TCFD is one of the best forms of doing that. And I think you know to, to Hubert's point. Um, we're seeing more granular disclosures year by year. So I'm not gonna answer your question, I'm just gonna say, David, please look at our TCFD report, which comes out, I think, next week. Um, but we've already published uh, the, you know, the highly carbon intensive um, sectors emission reduction targets. So that's in the public domain. It's, I think it's, so I've scribbled down the numbers, it's 44% for autos, this is 2030 targets, 44% reduction in autos, tank to wheel, uh, methodology. Uh, in the energy sector, which includes oil and gas, 42% scope one and scope two reductions, and 29% in scope three. And then for the power generation sector, it's 70% um, reductions by 2030. So I'll flip the question to you, and you tell me if you think that's greenwashing or if those are credible uh, reductions. Um, I could follow that up, but I'm going to, Julia, yeah. you go, um, please. Um, well, I, I was just going to pick up on the, the, the point Claire made about the sort of 87 months and ideological debates about data, and you're absolutely right. One of the things I've been worried about, and I have said this very publicly, is I think the perfect can become the enemy of the good in, in this debate. And we, we set up the voluntary carbon market the way we did in a very unusual way, and I had to get my colleagues comfortable with doing something that the London Stock Exchange doesn't usually do which is that we announced the intention to do something rather than went to da, here it is. And the reason is, I'm not a fan of inventing markets in conference rooms. I don't, think, I don't think it works. But fundamentally, we're already too late. So when we set it up, we had to know it was usable. We couldn't spend the first two years checking whether actually that architecture worked. Um, and so we, we sat around and, and spoke to everybody. We got all the engaged parties together and we got them to literally knot out every bit of the tricky questions. And that's that, it's the, that outcome that will be coming out um, later. But we have that problem in this debate in general. I have been advocating to the UK government that actually we think about a form of one-way equivalence, which is we have our own set of rules. Europe will have its set of rules. Canada will have theirs, and Australia will have theirs, and the US will have theirs, and the SEC will set their standards. Um, if they're good enough, we should allow companies to be able to use them if they've got a credible reason for that being the country that they come from and therefore that they'll use them. Um, other countries can choose to say, no, it's our way or no way. But if you want to create a genuinely global market for these things, I think you have to be prepared to say, our stands are here, but if you meet a baseline that's good enough, we will, we will actually facilitate flows. Um, and that absolute nickel and diming over per perfection actually becomes a barrier to activity. What markets need and what companies need is confidence in the sustainability of the framework in which they invest to know that they've got the confidence to commit long-term capital and that the rules aren't gonna change underneath them. Um, and it goes back to the point I made before. This is already a hard enough problem without us making our framework make it harder for us to solve. Um, and that's the thing that I think we need to keep constantly coming back to. 
Okay. Um, this, this question about um, the amount of money that's being um, uh, driven into fossil fuels versus renewables is one that all multilateral development banks are facing. Um, the AIB committed to align itself with the Paris Agreement, um, but then as um, the questioner asked, I think it was in 2020 there was this research showing that for every dollar committed to renewables there were two dollars going to fossil fuels. I think your data suggests that that actually may have shifted since then, or, or has it? No, I don't know what data is being referred. The 30% uh, uh, that is in green finance, the denominator there is all the lending of the AIB. I mean, AIB is not an energy lender. So you have social infrastructure, you have water, you have transport, you have metro systems. And, and large amounts of COVID relief uh, that was given to developing countries. So it's, it's not that the, uh, that the other 70% is in hydrocarbons. That, so I think there is a, just an interpretation issue. I think I just want to uh, 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 you know, endorse uh, what, uh, uh, what was said earlier. I think that the more prescriptive we become, uh, the further away we will be go from pragmatic reality. And, and I, and I think, I think that, will, that will create problems for, uh, for, I mean, you know, part of the greenwashing is actually being encouraged, in my opinion, because it is so prescriptive. And, and then you're, you, you find ways of, 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 of getting around it. I, I think we, 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 we need to, and for that, I think the mistake was moving too fast. I think I, you, you needed to lay out some of these guardrails with much more thinking uh, rather than do something quickly and then the bandwagon follows. So, so, the, so, so it got a bad name. But I think if we, if we take time for some of these things and do it properly, it can, it can be very helpful. Uh, 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 and, but incentives matter. And when you have large asymmetry of information, moral hazard creeps in. Uh, so I, th I think information systems and disclosures should have been much more thought of before, rather than going into this headlong, and you know meeting artificial deadlines. Uh, I mean, I think I think COP deadlines are artificial. That you know you need an agreement by that day, and and you know a whole bunch of institutions and entities line up to announce things, and and that and and then you end up with with things that don't work out. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. I just wanted to make another point on, the, on greenwashing and also perhaps to, to go back on that GFAN's point, uh, because I think uh, there are some fundamental questions which we need to keep in mind. If we take, for example, part of GFAN's, uh, the Net Zero Asset Management Alliance, um, we are all trying to make all sorts of commitments and we're obviously going to try to live up to those. But there is a fundamental issue, which is if we take temperature, which is implied temperature rise, which is the measure that uh, Mark Arney has been very keen to put forward, then effectively we need to go as an industry to one and a half degree, but basically the real economy is around three degree. And so the issue is, okay, is, if, is the asset management industry, should the asset management industry drive the real economy to three degrees? And if we do, then frankly, we need to stop doing business because we just simply will not be able to deploy capital in one and a half degree economy today, or should the real economy move towards one and a half degrees so that, the, um, so that the capital can be deployed. It's a very complicated and frankly very fundamental debate. Who should lead the way and how do we get people to move in sync? Just, just going back um, to some of the points that you were making just now, are you, are you saying that you think that the AIIB will continue to finance fossil fuel projects, gas and, and, and oil, in definitely in some measure, or do you see an end point? Well, I, I think that natural gas financing will continue as long as it is considered a transition fuel. I don't think AIB has financed any coal projects. So, uh, so I, think, I think we should, uh, we should not use the word hydrocarbons. I think we need to be, uh, I mean, this is part of the emotions that the press brings into this. Uh, <laughs> <Press>. <laughs> uh, so I think you also need to play your part in, uh, in the pragmatic realism that uh, that, that was mentioned on behalf of the London Stock Exchange. So I think uh, 
I think, um, uh, I think that uh, transitions are important. I mean, if you look at Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh has the, the only reliable fuel source of its own at this point in time is natural gas. I mean, uh, so. I'm very aware that um, I am what stands between um, you and lunch. Uh, but if there is anybody who has uh, a burning question that they'd like to put to the panel, now is your chance to very quickly put it. Uh, oh, well, sorry. Yes, yeah, electrifying. Very good point there. <laughs> and we have we have someone who is willing to take up that challenge. <laughs> but I'm delaying everyone's lunch. But I would. I would just really wanted to ask this question, and Juliet, reflect something you said. So I'm Cressida Pollock. I'm a member of the advisory board at the Smith School. And you talked about embedding it in every decision, um, whether it's the pencil supply chain or, or wherever it sits. And I actually would just love to take this opportunity to ask all of you, from everything you've said, we've talked a lot about goals, we've talked about targets, we've talked about sort of slightly macro and external figures. One of the big challenges for each of the organizations you work in is the leadership. But I don't just mean the leadership at the top. I mean how you're going to embed leadership on these decisions throughout your organizations. So it's not just setting the goal at Bank of America, of this is our climate financing goal. It's then thinking through the incentive structures, which allow your investment bankers to not finance coal projects, but to finance renewable projects. At the AIIB, I'm sure similarly, it's a question of how do you set those incentive structures to ensure that the deals that get done and the partnerships that get built are green, not, I'm thinking of all the words I'm not allowed to say here, but um, not, not, not necessarily gas or maybe gas appropriately. You know, Lombardodia as well, you know, it's not just what you ask the companies you invest in, but it's also how you think about the culture that you set the incentives you set for your teams and how you make those changes. And so I'd love to just sort of finish, if, if, I, if I may, by asking each of you how you're thinking about that within your organizations and how you're actually making those changes to empower people, not just at the top level in the C-suite, but all the way through it to be able to deliver against those commitments and actually bring about the, that kind of cultural shift. Okay, and in the interest of lunch, I'm going to ask you to do that in 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, not, not too much more than that, but I mean, uh, does anybody, yes, Uber, would you like to go? From an asset management perspective, we, our starting point, it's this transition is the biggest return, investment return opportunity. It's very easy to align everybody on this, because the only thing that is difficult is to make sure that you have enough research work and depth of research to really understand where these return opportunities will come. But transition, the whole transition, the story of the transition, cleaner is better and is cheaper, and it's and it's a great return opportunity. Very well done. Good. Yeah, and so for us, you know, we've made net zero advisory a core activity for all of our investment bankers, corporate bankers, and in the U.S. where we have smaller banking, if you like. Um, for, for every single one of those bankers, they're all getting training in decarbonization technologies, in financial solutions. Um, so it's really about capacity building and, and raising awareness. I'd put it down to the what, the why, and the how. Um, so the what is that we have group strategic um, objectives, which already cover this. And they cover this both for what we do as an organization and what we facilitate others to do too. So ours are, we're in an unusual position that's very similar to how I was as a regulator. You actually need to think about what you're doing internally within your shop, but also what you're doing externally and what you're doing there. And then the how, um, the why is something that's been an ongoing engagement with staff, and I don't meet anybody who works for the group who doesn't get the why. Um, you might get the why now versus a bit later, but that's a different debate. Um, the, the how is really the critical piece, which is what is the specific tooling and capability that you sitting in that seat, whether you're a technologist in London, Bangalore, or Sri Lanka, or whether you're selling data and analytics products in San Francisco, or whether you're running the London Stock Exchange, what are the specific capabilities you need in order to deliver your job through that lens? And that, is, that, that comes from what are we actually doing as an organization, and what do we therefore need these capabilities? So that's all being mapped out. But I think you have to look at it through those three, sort of the what, the why, and the how. And if you can capture all of those, you will cover it. I think the, um, uh, 
the, an important part of ensuring that, uh, uh, that we move in the right direction is that very clear corporate strategic goals are set and then management monitors them and it percolates down into the teams. It's actually not that complicated. I mean, for a young bank reaching 30% of green finance is because it is part of the corporate strategic goal from day one. And in a way, that's not a transition because the bank is relatively new. Uh, uh, but, but the important thing is that it, the goal is clear, understandable, and it percolates from the board to the uh, management, the deal teams, et cetera. Well, um, thank you, all of you. And um, could I just ask everybody to give our panel um, a very loud and long round of applause for some...